is Gilbert Gottfried from Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. Now, most of us know Paul Schaefer as the musical director of the David Letterman Show, which he's been doing for, I think, a thousand years now. But did you know that every year he's the director and producer at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremonies? Did you know that he helped create the Blues Brothers with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd? And he was the musical director of the house band for Saturday Night Live for several years. And he was the musical director of Godspell. He has worked with everybody in show business over the years. Sammy Davis Jr., Jerry Lewis, Bob Dylan, you name it, he's worked with them. You realize why David Letterman hired him and kept him all these years. He's fast, he's funny, he's witty, and best of all, he's a friend of mine, and he's here now, Paul Schaefer. It's Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. And a special guest we have on the show today, a friend of mine and a very talented performer, Mr. Paul Schaefer. Thank you so much, Gilbert, for that marvelous introduction. <laughs> and I, Frank I, Santo Padre. Yes. <laughs> How did you get him? Yeah. <laughs> There was a lot of begging involved. Yeah, well, this is going to be a good... You guys are an easy crowd. Easy audience. Okay. Now, <laughs> now, now, of course, yes. so my interviewing skills are to just turn it to me. Okay. As best as possible. All right. So let's talk let's, about the first time let's start I there. did the Letterman. First time you did the Letterman yes. show. Well, you know, um, a lot of guys are nervous when they do the show. And um, they can't wait to get on, and you know, and they jump their cues and everything. They don't wait for laughs. They're not relaxed. You were the opposite. <laughs> uh, I I usually give the comics a, a a choice of what music they want, um, because I figure they they have to come out and work and do their act, you know. And so they should have the music they. Everybody else, I decide the music. But for the comics, I say, what do you want? And I asked you that question. What Music do you want when you come out? And you said, well, I was thinking about um, the theme song uh, from um, Thick of the Night. I said, well, I love that. You know, you were, you, were a, uh, you were on Thick of the Night. You were a member of the rep company. Yes, with Richard Belcher. With, uh, yeah. with our, our yeah. mutual friend Richard Belcher. And there was, of course, the part... Uh, the, Several weeks running, uh, there was a running gag, if you will. You were up in the rafters. Yeah, in the kit walk. You refused to yes. come down yeah. in the kit. <laughs> Gilbert won't come down. He's in the kit walk. He, he won't come That's down. That's when they try retooling, and they tried retooling that show every week. Yes. And so I finally came up with this idea. You're the guy who lives in the catwalk. I see. <laughs> He won't come down. No. So <laughs> I, 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 we, we decided then on my theme music from Thick of the Night and yes. my season of Saturday Night Live, my two biggest failures. Well, I thought that that, that would be funny since <laughs> Thick of the Night had flopped. You, once you came down, they were off the air. And then the same, you did one season of Saturday Night, and that was a terrible flop too. Yes. <laughs> Was it even so the you, entire you, season? You said, so why not a medley of both of those songs, my two big flops, for when I come out? I said, well, you know, you only got like six minutes. If I do a medley, it's like you're going to be out there, and I'll, I'll just be going into the second song. You said, well, I'll just wait. <laughs> and you did. That's right. You came out and just re very patiently waited until I did the entire medley <laughs> of your two flops in a row. And then you... How's everybody doing tonight? You went, <laughs> you went on. And I, I've never, you know, respected a man more than I did you that evening. <laughs> um.
next guest uh, is a very odd and a very funny person. He can currently be seen in a motion, motion picture called Bad Medicine. Uh, I think you're in for a real treat here. Please welcome Gilbert Gottfried. Gilbert. <laughs> believe it oh that was wonderful oh that ah oh, what a beautiful crowd what a wonderful audience oh you're a beautiful crowd i love you i'd like to take you home with me i'd like to see you all naked i'd like to beat you i'd like to humiliate you i'd like to hang each one of you naked by your ankles and smear cheese all over your body did people really know the thick of the night theme I don't think anybody knew no. either. <laughs> I, I don't think Alan Thicke knew no. it. No. No, he didn't. But although he wrote it. Wrote it in the thick yes. of the night. I, you yeah. want to do a duet? Yeah. <laughs> Mama, Mama can leave the light on. I'm on the road tonight. <laughs> and we do a duel in uh, Canadian accents. And then there was the, the bridge. Everyone needs a dream to hold on. I'm going to make it on my own. Running in the thick of the night. What did that have to do with a talk show, though? Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> everyone needs a dream to hold on to. <laughs> so I guess his dream was this talk Getting a talk. Well, I suppose so. But I think he just subscribes to the... The tenet, the songwriting tenet, when you're stuck, just go into everyone needs a dream. <laughs> you know? It's the American Idol uh, way of songwriting. You follow your dreams. He was way ahead of his yes, time, really, because yeah. now they're all about follow your dreams. He, he was, was into it back in the 80s. <laughs> he was a renaissance yeah. man. <laughs> he could do everything. He could, and Friday night, as you remember, party night. Oh, yeah. That's when he would roll the sleeves up of his jacket. Yes! Yeah, and that's when you know it's party night, uh -huh. when a guy will roll the sleeves up of his jacket. I'm not talking about his shirt sleeve. The actual jacket sleeves would go up, you know? <laughs> Serious. With, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, what, yeah, that's how you know. You're a party it's, animal. Yeah, it's party night, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that was the first time that you did Letterman. Yes. I played that music, but I don't know when it was that we first met. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's the first time we actually had a real out-and-out -out conversation. Well, and, and, we, the, and this is the second. Yes. This is the second <laughs> time right here. It's going very well. Yeah, I think so, too. Thank you, George Fenneman. Yeah. <laughs> nice to have George you Fenneman flatter on. flatter me, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you're a lovely couple, and now it's time to play you by Chile. Yeah. <laughs> Stay warm. <laughs> That's what Charlie Chaplin told him. Told Groucho? Yes. Stay warm. Yes. Yeah. Well, he was right. You know, <laughs> when you get older, it's, you, it's harder and harder to stay warm. That's why it, that's the greeting for it. <laughs> elderly people. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'll just, just hit you with a bunch of things. Let me have these things, and I'm going to give you the first thing that comes in my mind. <laughs> Go for it, Gilbert. Okay. Uh, Ed Sullivan. Well, uh, you know, the greatest variety show ever in the history of television, and a show which... Uh, all of us uh, of a certain vintage, you and I are included, and I don't know about Frank Central. He's half our age, Frank Central Padre. Uh, that's a slight. But thing. you heard? Did you ever hear about a thing the Salt the Ed Sullivan show? Very familiar with it, Paul. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, it was big uh, in my household. I'll tell you that uh, up in Canada, and it's a good thing too because Ed, you know, week after week, was, now for all of you in the United States and Canada, he would always. <laughs> Take care of us people up in Canada. Yeah, well, those you up in Canada because it was a syndication deal up there. You know, he, had a, he wanted to keep running up there too. So, uh, like every family, my family was in front of the television set 8 p.m. sharp and watched the Ed Sullivan show. And of course, for us kids, we had uh, you know the latest British Invasion Act, or uh, before that, Bo Diddley. Uh, remember that thing? I, uh, did you ever see it on? Uh, on uh, YouTube, Ed Sullivan introduces Bo Diddley, and no. it is absolutely for real. <laughs> now, up in Ed Schiffrin's Apollo Theater, the people have been going mad for 
this next gentleman who plays a kind of music which you call rhythm and what is rhythm and color? What is it? <laughs> yeah, rhythm and blues. He couldn't think of rhythm and blues. He said ryth- rhythm and color. <laughs> Swear to God. But it was another time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as everybody knows, Harlem, whenever any new musical trend has evinced itself in the popular field, whether it's the Charleston or the Black Bottom or any of the rhythm songs, the first area to find out about it in advance is Harlem. A couple of weeks ago, I went up in Harlem. I'd seen these shots in the newsreels about thousands of people jamming the streets around Frank Schiffman's Apollo Theater, all trying to get in to see Dr. Jive's Row Rhythm and uh, Rhythm and Row, Rhythm and Color, Rhythm and Blues. So here is Dr. Jive. I want you to meet this young disc jockey. And he had all those acts that he, well, uh, Topo G. Joe, of the little Italian mouse that he brought over. And do you know who wrote the Topo Gigio uh, sketches? No. Miss Joan Rivers, ladies and really? gentlemen. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's one of the trivia. ways she started out, at least if you believe her. I, I oh. read it in, in an interview she gave just wow. a little while ago. I, I wrote the Topo Gigio sketches for wow. Sullivan. <laughs> so she had a, yeah, can you imagine? Speaking of Sullivan, uh, yeah. Paul, tell, uh, tell Gilbert a little bit about, Rick, we were discussing it before you got here, Ricky Lane and Velvel. <laughs> yes, well, you saw... <laughs> Everybody from the the uh, animals and the Dave Clark Five to Tessie O'Shea, uh, the marvelous Irish music hall act that mm-hmm. he brought over. Our mutual friend and, Tom Leopold always talks about the chimps. And uh, the, Bobby yeah. Berenzini's that's chimps, right. yeah, right. we would see them. Right. And then, uh, who was it? Who, oh, yes, Ricky Lane and Velvel, <laughs> the Yiddish comic, Yiddish ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> and the dummy was Yiddish, Velvel. <laughs> Yeah, and you remember this, don't you, Gilbert? But Ricky Lane and Velvet. Um, well, it happens that, uh, and, and I would have been about 12 years old, 11, 11 years old maybe at the time. Uh, Sullivan was the biggest, the United States and Canada. And uh, Ricky Lane went on a Canadian tour uh, selling Israeli bonds. <laughs> Okay, and he was going to come to Thunder Bay, Ontario, the Israeli Bond Drive, this year starring Ricky Lane and Velva. Well, the whole town was up in arms. Everyone was so excited, kids, adults alike, <laughs> Jews and Goyim alike, because he, Ricky Lane, the Sullivan Show was so big that Ricky Lane and Velva were above, uh, you know, they, they blasted off right into ecumenicism. They had to, even though it was, you know, they, they knew they were probably only going to sell Israeli bonds to the Jews. Nonetheless, this evening had to be opened up to Jews and Goyim alike. He, he, the mayor was going to come, the Gentile mayor and everybody, the whole community was going to come. Now, it was an Orthodox synagogue where they were going to appear, so the food all had to be uh, glot kosher. And that means they had to bring this food in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, because, you, you know, there wasn't exactly a glot kosher butcher <laughs> in Thunder Bay. I, there may have been at one time, but not at this time. So the food was being brought in from Winnipeg. And my parents a little feeling a little bit uncomfortable about their uh, Gentile friends coming and, and having to eat kosher food and stuff, you know. But they were keeping a stiff upper lip <laughs> uh, because it was all, you know, the, the, the most shishi of, of Goyim were going to come to this thing. Uh, and everybody was a little uptight. So comes the big evening, and it's huge, and a rabbi starts out. Uh, selling bonds, and that once they get the business out of the way, then, then they're going to move into the entertainment. The rabbi gives his pitch, selling bonds and how much Israel needs the money, but it must have been a hard year because nobody's buying. And he says, so, you know, who's going to buy the first bond? Nobody put up their hand. Nobody is going to buy an Israeli bond, and the rabbi starts to flip out. And he loses his temper, and he starts yelling at the congregation, you people, you don't know... You know, what would the state of Israel and what it would be like and you people and he's just he's red in the face and he screams his his guts out and now ladies and gentlemen, Ricky Lane and Velvet. <laughs> Ricky's gotta follow that. And I remember so clearly seeing him down on his knees with his, his suitcase open because the dummy is in a suitcase. <laughs> of course. And he's sticking his hand, he's down on his knees, sticking his hand up, the you-know-what of the dummy, getting ready for his act. And meanwhile, he's saying, wow, 
Rabbi, wow. This is uh, what I got to follow. Wow. I mean, no, really. I mean, Rabbi, don't feel too bad about it. I mean, wow, I got to do comedy after that. Wow. I just, <laughs> don't worry, Rabbi. We'll talk to the people and I'm sure that we will. Mm, wow. You know, that, that was his, that was his intro. I never forgot it. And now an, another person we're both fascinated by. Yes. Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Well, I watched uh, that telethon uh, faithfully. Uh, 1976, of course, the greatest year, the year that Frank Sinatra brought Dean on as a surprise for Jerry. Oh, yeah. Who will ever forget it, right? Jerry didn't like I don't think he liked it initially. He, he, was, caught, he was caught off guard. Caught off he? guard. Yeah. He doesn't really like yeah. surprises on his own show anyway. Uh, but boy, he had to, you know, Frank Sinatra, you are the kind of human being that would bring on a man's en enemy on his own show and surprise him. The kind of man that you are, you know, I'll get you for this. And he gave him what we used to call the Vegas fist. <laughs> just, <laughs> Vegas fist. just pretending I'll get you, I'll get you for this, you know, a fist it. that doesn't really mean anything. It, it seemed like Dean Martin was uncomfortable too. Well, he... Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I hate when that happens. Yeah. You think Dean was uncomfortable? What made yeah, you think so? Yeah, I don't know. He looked like he, he wasn't sure what he was doing. I don't know if he knew where he was. Yeah. I don't think he was sure <laughs> where, he, where he was. But yeah. By the way, I want to reschedule this when we can be face to face. <laughs> <laughs> That's another show. That's a reference to another show. <laughs> Yeah, the audience yeah. hears the other show, then yeah, they'll, they'll know what they'll I meant. Yeah, then they'll understand what I meant by Sheck, that. Yeah. Shecky Green agreed to do my podcast, and he goes on, and he goes, we're going to have to talk face-to-face. -face. And, so, <laughs> and he walked a, off. It was yeah. a six-minute podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, some pods are, are bigger than others. <laughs> That's all. Now, uh, oh, the Chevy, I was at this. I don't think I, I roasted him, but I was there. Uh, at the Chevy Chase, I, yeah, it was on the dais of the Chevy Chase roast. The infamous Chevy Chase roast. Why didn't you roast him? I don't know. I always like, if I could be there, I've asked them a few times at these roasts, can I just sit on the dais and not, I won't have any pressure. I can eat and just sit there and have my name yelled So out. you really go for the free lunch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Does that surprise you, Paul? I've gone in the other direction. After I did my last roast, I was never asked again, well, you can sit on the dais, but just don't open your mouth. And I say, you know what, maybe not, but next, now I know I'll give my space to you. Yes. Because you want the free lunch. They would never ask me anymore to speak. Uh, not after that Chevy Chase thing, which was... Well, let's put it this way. When you open up, as I did, I was the roast master, and I opened up with a song, which I think characterized the, the situation with the whole evening. The song was called, We Couldn't Get Anybody Good. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome our roast master, Paul Schaefer. Tonight is Chevy McKnight. We call his friends to invite them all to join us at Roast Him, but none of them would. Does he have a career? I thought he died last year. We couldn't get anybody good. It's a whole show of no shows, no glamour or glitz. Say the name Chevy Chase, and no one gives two sh**. Sit on the day is for Chase. I wouldn't sit on his face. That's why we couldn't get anybody good. But hey, I know what you're thinking. Who's Schaefer to talk? This guy got his job sucking Letterman's <laughs> He's a lucky piano player, a musical hack. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, all of you. At least I'm earning a check. I'm serious. You can all go no, no, yourselves. No, no, you can no, kiss no, my no, shade no, all that. No, I got more no, money than everybody hey, in this. What, no, what, what, what? Take what? this. Oh. Here, drink this. You feel better. Pretty close. Sorry. The man's career is a disgrace. No one here knows Chevy Chase. And there's no reason that anyone should. But since you've rented your tux, just accept this roast sucks and that we couldn't get anybody. We asked Will Ferrell, we couldn't get anybody. 
We scraped the barrel! Ah, yeah, we could have! Yeah, anybody! Good! He's Chevy Chase and you're not! Chevy, good night. You're I'm sorry, man. It's over. Because it was mainly people on the day it's not, that he didn't know. <laughs> it was young comedians, yeah, right? Yeah, like Greg young, Giraldo and young people comedians, like that. Yeah, Greg young comedians who took advantage. None of them knew him, but they mm-hmm. all took advantage of the opportunity to really trash him. Not necessarily for laughs, either. Which I understand is what you do in a row. You trash the person. <laughs> Ideally, there's some comedy. But everyone loves each other so much that, you know, you can say anything about the guy. This, they didn't know him, so they felt they could say anything about him. And it really was a sort of a massacre. Uh, you remember it. Oh, yeah, it was. And then there was that long speech at the end when Chevy finally gets up. Well, he didn't know. First of all, he was taking notes all through. Yes, I roast. remember. Yeah, taking notes. And we thought when he finally gets up at the end, he is going to put everybody away. It, it looked that way. He'd have rebuttal. He, yeah. he had a smirk on his face and he would take notes. And I thought, oh, the, he's going to explode when he goes. Yeah. Through. And he had one. He did open strong. He said, I would thank all the comics, but I don't see a fucking one, honestly. <laughs> you know, everyone enjoyed that. And after that, you know, when he turned to Al Franken, and instead of saying, Al, you were hilarious, he said, Jesus, Al. I mean, that, <laughs> wow. I know. You're not yeah. really going to get a laugh no. <laughs> with a Jesus, Al. Wow. Otherwise, though, he acquitted himself uh, very nicely. I think he was a little shaken by it, though. Uh-huh. And that was the last time I ever got to participate in a roast at the fire <laughs> Now, you also knew, um, oh, uh, Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys? Yes. Yeah. Um, Brian is a genius. Um, he had a, a rough upbringing. Um, he, uh, he, I don't think he makes a secret of it. He took his share of uh, psychedelic drugs and such. And whatever it was, you know, genius as he is, it left him talking a little bit like uh, a Bill Murray character. You remember Bill Murray's character, the honker? Uh, yes. Well, that's the way Brian, <laughs> the, Brian talks. And I think it's, it's just a defense mechanism. Whatever it is, I was, uh, it, Brian helped me with an album that I made in 1989. He and I collaborated on one cut on the album. And I was um, supposed to move in that weekend with uh, my wife, Kathy, and I. She, we weren't married at the time, but we were about to move in together, finally, get our, a place together. And she, we're, we were going to move in together, but I said, honey, I got to go to the coast and, and work with Brian Wilson. And she says, have a heart, you know, how can you do that? But, you know, when you, as you know, when you, when you got to go, you got to go. So now I am on the West Coast with Brian, and we're in the studio, and the, the song is getting, the more we work on it, the worse the song is getting. Uh, sometimes that happens, you know, you can overwork a thing, and that's what was happening to us. It was getting worse and worse, and then Kathy calls up to the studio. I'm in the new apartment, honey, and the whole building is shaking. It's a windstorm, and the building is oscillating and, and trembling and shaking from side to side. <laughs> and I'm in the, you know, I'm trying to do a song with Brian Wilson, and she's 3,000 miles away, and I don't know <laughs> what to do because the song I'm working on is getting worse and worse. So I look around, and I'm, what am I going to say? And I, and I guess the perverse side of my personality took over, and I said, uh, Brian, uh, Kathy is uh, in the... New apartment all by herself, and the building is shaking. Can you see if you can? And I pass the phone over to Brian Wilson. I just, I can't, believe, I don't know what's going to happen, you know. But that's how perverse I am. And he takes the phone, and he says, hey, hey, Kathy, he says, you know, these, uh, these tall buildings, uh, you know, anything over 35 stories, it's kind of built to be elastic, you know, and it's supposed to <laughs> give in the wind, and that's the way, you know. And, and somehow he calmed her down, you know. As the honker, said, okay, thanks, Brian. And she can go, I can go to bed now, honey, and that's it. <laughs> Happily ever after. So you never know what a rock and roll genius will do when he'll come through for you. And then he had that weird psychiatrist that lived with him who was claiming ownership of all of his songs. Dr. Landy. 
Dr. Landy was yeah. on the scene when I was. He's no longer uh, with the living, apparently. Dr. Landy oh, died. Oh, okay. okay. Know that. But yeah, he went from being Brian's therapist to being Brian's co-writer and producer and, and owning all, all of the material. Um, and um, I had to deal with this. Um, every day, it was getting, things were getting worse and worse. It wasn't really the doctor, Dr. Lanny, that was the scariest, but it was these little, little boys that he would send over to spy on Brian and, and call him surreptitiously so that he would know everything that was going on in the studio. You know, well, Brian, I hear you guys uh, didn't come up with a second verse. Hey, how did you know that, Dr. Lanny? <laughs> oh, just a little bird told me. But really, these kids, and we call them the surf Nazis because that was almost like what they were like. They were spies, you know. They were Luftwaffe <laughs> SS spies <laughs> calling in. So um, every day I would get up, and I was staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood and say, how am I going to face the studio again? And I'd be down at the pool, you know, getting a little color. At least if I go in looking good, I'll feel better. And who would pull up a chair right beside me by the pool? Tommy Toon. <laughs> wow. The Broadway legend. And he's a, seven feet on tall. a very long chaise lounge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. George yeah. Fenneman, long chaise long. Very funny. Thanks. <laughs> so, I do what I can. Yeah. You know, so I, I started oh. talking to him, Tommy. I don't know, there's a guy, Brian Wilson, and I, you may know you're more Broadway-oriented, but there was a thing called surf music, and even the little old lady from Pasadena, and the thing California Girls is so great, and now there's a guy, Dr. Landy, and he was his therapist, and now he owns all the stuff, and I don't know what to do, because now his girlfriend, Landy's girlfriend, wants to write the lyrics to the song. What am I going to do, Tommy? <laughs> and Tommy said, embrace the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's it. I the don't wisdom know. of Tommy, too. Yeah, we'll be right back. Wow. Yeah. Embrace the doctor. That's it. That's all you have to know. Speaking of music, You know, I, I did a music yeah. video with the Beach Boys. Hmm. They sang the theme song to Problem Child. Really? And, and that was a, a movie that you starred in? Yes. <laughs> Problem Child? Well, excuse me. I, I, wow. I, I don't go to movies too much. <laughs> Was that what it was? Frank? He's, Frank? he's been holding out on me. Frank, was Problem, he in Problem Child? He, he was also in Problem Child 2, Paul. Those are movies. Yeah, you missed them both. And okay. I was in Problem Child 3. Yes. A TV movie. <laughs> ah. Problem Child 3, Junior in Love. And it, it, John Ritter wouldn't do it, so they had William Cat, Greatest American Hero. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know who the kid was. Okay. <laughs> So, getting back, the Beach Boys sang the <laughs> theme the song. Segue. The theme song, yeah. yeah. How did it go? Okay. Na, 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 na. Ba, ma, 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 ma. Oh, yeah. Who wants to grow up? Who wants responsibility? Oh, no, not me. Who wants to show up and work until you're 93? Oh, oh no, not, not me. Not me. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> and then it had that, you know. It was a theremin. The boys, yeah. yeah. Now everybody says you're running wild. The teacher's calling you a problem. Ooh. That's when the you who say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. See, rather than saying child, uh -huh. they lead you that and they're going to say problem child. They go problem. Ooh. Oh, yes. well, it's almost like uh, this child. Is not, that's not blue. Is child a uh, dirty word? <laughs> Maybe to some people. No, it made it one of those cool song choices. <laughs> so then they were performing in the, in the music video and you were yeah. in, in the video too? Yes. Playing the problem yeah. child? Uh, uh, no, they had no. the actual kid there. Oh, oh. And yeah. what were you, the therapist? <laughs> I was... He was I, Dr. Was, I was claiming ownership <laughs> yes. to the problem child theme. Yeah. <laughs> he was the Dr. Landy well, of Well, you should child. have been speaking to Tommy Toon about this. And <laughs> embrace the He would have said, doctor. embrace the doctor. <laughs> That's right. That... I'd like to have that as my slogan Embr in life. <laughs> Embr Embrace the doctor. You can have it. I'll talk to Tommy <laughs> Toon's people. Can we have Embrace the Doctor? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Just this morning, I came upon a seven-year-old. Ah, uh, smartest attack, a little rambunctious, but weren't we all at that age? <laughs> The 
You also knew Phil Spector. Yes, he and I had a 20-year a, a friendship, and we're still friends, as a matter of fact. Um, I got a call from him after he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame back in the 80s. Uh, well, not from him. You didn't really hear from him, but from an assistant. Mr. Spector wants to know if uh, you'd like to hear some jazz music, and I didn't believe it could possibly be him. Uh, but it turned out, turned out to be him, and... Uh, he, he was a, a lovely guy, almost obsequious in, in, in how polite he was. Always stand up if a lady went, got up to go to the powder her nose, you know. Uh, and, of course, one of my all-time uh, greatest uh, uh, idols, rock idols uh, ever, and, and still a genius, and uh, terrible what, what's happened uh, with him. But people, uh, they, they separate the music from you know, from, from the musician, and they still talk about how wonderful that music is, and I still believe that it is. What did you think, or did you see the Al Pacino TV movie? Yeah, I, I did see it. Um, all I can say is that when it opens up, Pacino, as Spectre, is ranting about the record Abraham, Martin, and John, and about how they added the verse about Bobby as an afterthought. It's an afterthought. And I heard him do that actual rant live. Wow. In one of those jazz clubs that we went to. So I don't know where this guy Mamet was, how he heard it. He must have been under the table with a, with a tape recorder because I heard it live. And that's just an inkling of how accurate this thing was. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I and and it. you thought Pacino did a good job? Gino Salomon from, uh, <laughs> yeah. from Gino, Milwaukee? Gino Salomon gets a reference. How did he? You know Gino Salomon? <laughs> sure. How do you, Frank, how do you know? Who doesn't know him? <laughs> well, he's a guy who used to work in radio in Milwaukee. <laughs> the name has been bandied about. <laughs> so did you think... Wait, he talks about yep. it? Yep. Did he ever... Did Gino ever represent uh, Gilbert? <laughs> uh, Gino has come up more than, a, more than yeah, once or yeah. twice. How do you in, work him into the in, conversation? In conversation? <laughs> Are you still in touch with him? Oh, yeah. Does, let's, let's give Gino his due. Does he... Uh, now, go yeah. ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, did you think Al Pacino did a good job as Spectre? <laughs> And, and Gino, <laughs> Gino, <laughs> or Gino Gino directed him. Yeah, I think he did a good job. I mean, one of the things is that there's a lot of tape now. There was a time when you couldn't... I played Spectre in a thing, a live presentation back in the 80s, and I didn't know, you know, what does he sound like? I didn't know because you couldn't hear any tape. But now there's lots of video, and I think all that Pacino had to do was study him, and he, he got him down, and he actually got him down. But he got him down. But let's get back to Gino... <laughs> Salomon. Well, I know he has a a, a crush on, uh, on Sandra Bullock. Who you have a theory about Sandra Bullock? Well, uh, she's Jewish. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a that's theory. Just, I don't know. Theory? <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I don't know if Lewis is Jewish yet, but but she's uh, yeah. Sandra Bullock is Jewish. Now, how did you find out that Sandra Bullock was Jewish? Gino told me. <laughs> Any more questions? I got to reschedule this <laughs> so we can be face to face. <laughs> yeah, Gino has a, t a crush on Sandra Bullock. He and he used to say, "Live the dream" or something, right? Yes. <laughs> Believe in the dream, and the dream was that he was going to get to marry Sandra Bullock. Yes, but how did you? And it would be a, a Jewish wedding, of course. But how did you find out that Sandra Bullock was? <laughs> well, I think it was when, he, when she stepped on the glass. Oh, at, yes. At that wedding, yeah. <laughs> That was weird. And, I don't remember how. And I, when, sometimes you just know these things. When my when I used to watch the Ed Sullivan show with my parents, <laughs> my dad would be watching, and he was uncannily he was able to spot who had a toupee and who didn't, <laughs> and who was Jewish yeah. and who wasn't. You know, so that's when you sit there. Oh, there's a good toupee. Oh, look, yeah. Tony Ben. Oh, look at that great. Oh, no. that's a good. Oh, that's a good toupee. Franti and Tatcha. Ooh, bad toupee. Oh, oh, those are bad. Bad to pay. And oh, Jewish, you know, oh, that Tony Bill, Jewish, you know. 
<laughs> so that you, I, I developed a so sixth, you develop a sixth that. sense about and, who's Jewish and, and who wears a toupee. And you know, Sandra Bullock's Jewish but doesn't wear a toupee. Well, I don't know if she wears a toupee or not. But <laughs> I know that she's definitely Jewish. So, because I always thought she she admits to being German. Oh, she does? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, or I don't know if she, but like her mother was a big opera, German opera star. Oh, her mother was a o- German opera star? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like the beginning of the Third Reich. Most, Ju- <laughs> <laughs> most, Jew- most Jewish, uh, m- most German opera stars are Jewish, <laughs> as it turns out. I don't know. Do you ever get letters uh, from the podcast? Well, what, well, Werner. Let's have people oh, call yeah. Werner Klemperer. Werner, Werner Klemperer, yeah. his father, Otto Klemperer. Werner, of course, was Hogan. Yeah, yes. And uh, his father, Otto Klemperer, was a uh, famous German uh, conductor. conductor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm for, I know that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think he used to date Sandra Bullock's mother. <laughs> mother. So there. There you have it. Well, was Werner Jewish? Oh, yes. Both the Nazis on Hogan's Heroes were Jews. Schultz? Yeah, yes, yeah, Schultz. John, John, John Banner. John Banner was and Jewish? John Banner not only was a Jew, but he, was, he and his family were in the camps. Wow. But the camps weren't quite made into death camps at that point. So they were he, fun yeah, camps. Yeah, they fun. were fun. <laughs> there was sewing <laughs> activity. Fun camps, yeah. <laughs> Sewing Fishing. circle, yeah. It was all. <laughs> Paul, we were talking about your parents, and yes, before, wait, we're and, talking, uh, we're making jokes uh, about the concentration camp. <laughs> Why are you interrupting? Yeah. <laughs> I thought we might add a little humor to the show. <laughs> Do something radical. Paul's parents were very hip parents, and they took him to, to <laughs> Vegas you. to yeah. see Juliet Prowse. Yes. In fact, it was the first time you ever took the stage with Jackie Gale. Um, uh, I was a part famous? of Jackie Gale's act. Yes. I didn't actually walk on stage, and I want to be clear oh, okay. about that. <laughs> yeah. But you were a foil. Because he there may to... be somebody who was there. Uh, that's true. And <laughs> right in to Gilbert's pocket. <laughs> Paul Shaver was never on stage with Jackie Gale. <laughs> that's what I was aiming for I don't want to be, yeah. Uh, we saw a number of performers uh, on that trip. Uh, uh, again, I think I was 12 or mm-hmm. 13. First trip to Las Vegas ever, a 12-year-old kid with my parents. And we saw Nat Cole. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I'll never forget it. And we saw... And Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan in the lounge. Unbelievable. Fantastic. We saw Vaughn Meter and the First Family Review. Wow. Now, you remember. Oh, my God, sure. yeah. Vaughn sure. Meter had a... He He's, had a series of comedy albums in which he did an impression of President Kennedy. Jack Kennedy... And the albums were big hits. And so he had a review with the cast from the album in Las Vegas. And my dad said, I would not walk across the street to see Von Meter. <laughs> but you wanted to see Von I Meter. I forced him to. Uh-huh. Yeah. I forced him to. And his entire career ended when Kennedy was shot. Well, you remember the story about uh, Lenny Bruce the night after can I tell it? Yeah, I, go I, ahead. It's your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> you're a guest, so you get to well, tell the story. Well, he was the night of, uh, the night after the uh, the assassination uh, in Chicago. Lenny Bruce was, uh, was appearing in a nightclub, and every, the tension was high. And people are, what is he going to say? He's so politically oriented. He, he's incisive. He cuts to the chase when it comes to political commentary. What is he going to say about the assassination of President Kennedy? Well, he comes out. You can hear a pin drop. It's quiet. He sits down on a stool, grabs a mic, and he says, Whew, Vaughn Meter, man. <laughs> wow. That, that was, said it all. Yeah, that said it all. And I think Vaughn Meter found out because he was working out of town. He got in a cab. The cab driver says, hey, did you hear about Kennedy? And he thought it was going to be, oh, another joke. Right. So he goes, all right, let's hear it. And he goes, he was shot. And that's when Vaughn Meter's entire no, career yeah. dried right, up. Right, that was it. That was it for Vaughn Meter. Anyway, we, we saw Vaughn Meter, but we also saw uh, Juliet Prowse opening at Jackie Gale. And we're sitting, uh, you know, my dad says, well, let me just show you how to schmear. 
I'm <laughs> a maitre d', you know, and we'll get a good, you know. So for those of you uh, not of the Jewish persuasion, I'm talking about uh, bribe. Uh-huh. You know, this is a, you can put a smear of peanut butter on a piece of toast, or you can use the term to mean bribe the maitre d'. Well, he smeared the maitre d', you know, a good five bucks, and it didn't get us anyway. We were the very, very last row of this showroom. <laughs> But before Jackie Gill went on, the maitre d' came, we have a better seat for you people, and and he moved us right up to ringside. Didn't understand why. Turned out that Jackie Gill needed a kid to talk to in his act. And he talked to a kid ringside, and and it was was I. And he said to to kids today, you know, forget about it, they're so spoiled. Give me an idea. Hey, you, kid. And he looks at me, he says, how many televisions you got in your your house? And I told the truth. I said, one. (laughs) He moved on. He went and he talked to a kid on the other side of the stage. Yes, my first time in showbiz. That was that is how I knew I was actually in showbiz. Mm-hmm. I remember growing up, it seemed like Juliet Prouse was on TV every day. Well, when she was uh, going with Sinatra, she was on TV every day. That's all it took, you know. She's dating Frank Sinatra. Are you kidding? Book her. <laughs> And that's why we went to see her, but it, it was great, you know, when we finally went to see her, for legs up to her neck, and uh, every number more exciting than the last. I loved it. I was 12 at the time. And but she, I would love it to, even today. And, and much like Charlize Theron, she, she also was an African-American. Yes, that's right. Very much like Charlize Theron. And, and uh, very similar to the Bee Gees. <laughs> she was, oh no, they were Australian. <laughs> Uh, who's that? Same thing. Yes, an African American, a South African. <laughs> yes. My drummer on uh, Letterman, Anton, is uh, is South African, and it is a South South African. South African. <laughs> That's my impression of a South African accent. <laughs> South African. Now John Belushi. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Legend. Okay. Um. And, uh, you know, I did the Blues Brothers with John and Dan Aykroyd and put together that uh, Blues Brothers band for them. We had our pick of the greatest uh, R&B and blues musicians in in the country because everybody wanted to play for them. They were so hot. And um, it was, you didn't know if it was comedy. Are they sending up the music? Are they making fun of it? Are they trying to do it? Um, Neither John and Danny really... uh, claimed to be all that great shakes as musical performers, but they both had a little bit of experience. They had been in rock bands in in school, and I didn't think the act was, you know, all that special until I started to see more recently all the tribute bands and clone acts that do a tribute to the Blues Brothers and do the act. And when I see that, I say to myself, you know what, it wasn't so bad, not so bad at all. And John could actually put put across a number. He could deliver a number and... Uh, and do so in a credible fashion. And what did you think of Blues Brothers 2? Well, I was, you know, I didn't get to be in Blues Brothers 1. Yeah. <laughs> so Blues Brothers 2 uh, was my favorite of the two Blues Brothers movies. Now, it only sold four tickets, and I bought all four <laughs> for my family. But aside from that, I was very proud of the music in that, in that movie. That, that's when they added a kid to it. That's always the scary They stuff. added a kid to it, yeah. Well, the studio said, you've got to add a kid. <laughs> and I you said, warm up, make the Blues Brothers a little more yeah, heartwarming. More heart, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah. They said, whatever you want. Tell us about seeing Belushi for the first time, uh, uh, Paul, because you saw him in Lemmings do Joe Cocker the first time you ever saw him. Yeah, so. he was phenomenal. I mean, his Joe Cocker impression was... Uh, Remembered from SNL. It has never been equal since then. Um, that Lemmings was a hell of a show. It was, uh, Chevy Chase was in it too, and, and uh, other people that Chris we know Guest were. was in it. Chris Guest yeah. was in it as well. Yeah. And it was a parody of the Woodstock Festival, which gave them the framework within which to uh, do uh, un- incredibly uncannily accurate impressions of all the great rock performers at the time. Belushi was a force of nature, no question about it. Um, he and I butted up against each other a little bit when I was working for him in the Blues Brothers. Um, but, um, I certainly missed the cat. 
What do you think now, about that? Now, did, yeah. did you ever... Well, you were watching. You were looking at your notes. Yes, yes, I was. <laughs> to she see was. what yes. to ask me next. Yeah, yeah. You Don't you know the whole thing about... Uh, instead of looking at it, you're supposed to be listening to the guy. <laughs> no. And his answer. I've been on enough radio shows <laughs> to know that in the middle of an answer... The guy is like checking the boards and looking over notes and well, talking to other people. Well, that's what you're nicely done. Yes. <laughs> see, now yeah, you're impressed. Yeah, yes, yes. Did you ever see the Charlie's Angels episode with Sammy Davis Jr.? No, boy, I, I really, I'm, I missed out on something. Oh, you owe it to oh. yourself. Now, I've, I know the name of the game uh, episode with Sammy Davis Jr. You're not confusing these two things, are you? No, Jay, no, no they're, they're both Jay, great. Tony own, Franciosa. Yeah, sure. Yeah. They're both great in their Let own respects. Let me hear respects. a little bit about the, the Charles oh, Angels okay. episode, and then we'll talk. He does a, a tour de force. <laughs> he plays two roles. One, he's Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. And the other is he's a guy named Herbert who owns a supermarket who looks just like I Sammy see. Davis Jr. And is Herbert a sort of a nerdy guy? Yes, I yes. See. A bookish, bookworm kind of guy? And then you know how shows in that era always had to end with a joke? Yeah, yeah. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. So that they could put that sound effect in. Yeah, and yeah. so this one had a double joke. This I got to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hear that. At, at the end... Uh, Sammy is there. They capture the people who thought they were kidnapping Sammy Davis Jr., who were actually kidnapping Herbert. And then okay. at the end, he goes, you know, I'm the most talented guy in this room. Herbert, as Sammy as Herbert says this. And Sammy, with a non-threatening, uh, uh, very affable uh, black power fist, uh, goes right on, Herbert. Uh. And that's one joke. Yeah. And you figure that would be enough. Uh, for me, it would have been. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been. Yeah. But they break for a commercial and come back, and Sammy and Altavis oh. walk in on the Angels and say, we're going to a big opening, <laughs> me and Altavis. And they go, an opening? Oh, that's great. What will I wear? And they get old girly. And he goes, it's an opening of Herbert's new supermarket. Oh. So it was. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, it was the greatest <laughs> Charlie's Angels. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you worked with Sammy, didn't you? I, I got to On work a couple with him of twice. Yeah, yeah, twice. But both times uh, were. He uh, was Jewish. Yes, he was. Yes. <laughs> I've heard. He sure was. And each time I worked with him was, a, was an education. Uh, first time was when Letterman Show was uh, uh, doing shows from Las Vegas. Um, and he uh, came in um, from working uh, the night before in Boston with the Boston Pops. He was always working, this guy. Uh, I got to talk to him once before he before the show, and I said, what song do you want to do with me in the band? And he said, you tell me, man. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? Well, you pick out something for me that cooks and swings, man. And let me know what it is. <laughs> Swear to God, and I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> what am I going to do? So I, uh, I thought and I thought, and I asked the different guys in the band, and actually it was Will Lee, who both of you guys know, who plays bass with me on the, on the yep. show. Uh, who came up with two great ideas for Sammy. Oh, and the other thing I forgot to mention was we weren't going to get a chance to rehearse because he was flying all night from Boston the night before. He's going to get there just in time for the show, no rehearsal. What can we play for Sammy Davis? No rehearsal. So Will said, well, maybe for once in my life, uh, Stevie Wonder version, because that's a song he knows very well, or perhaps uh, on Broadway, George Benson version, also kind of uh, in his wheelhouse. Every time I called from then on, he was either sleeping or working. And I would call day after day. And Altavis would pick up the phone. He said, uh, may I speak to Sammy Davis Jr.? She said, this is Altavis Davis. Well, I was so thrilled. To, it was Alto. Alto. <laughs> and I knew to call her Alto from watching the Johnny Con. Alto, I said. <laughs> she didn't miss a beat. Yes, it's me. I said, where's Shmuel? Using his Yiddish name, because that's what the that Rat Pack called him. That was Sammy's... Yiddish, Yiddish name? name. Shmuel? Shmuel. That's Sammy and, and Jewish. Oh. Fantastic. Sammy and Jewish. What's Sandra Bullock's Yiddish? Well, that I don't know. <laughs> okay. Sorry. 
I am going to reschedule this when we can be face to face. I said, Alto, where's Shmuel? He said, Shmuel is sleeping. Oh, you know, always sleeping. Well, I'll call back tomorrow. And I didn't, I never got him. And it's the morning of the show and I'm on the, in the showroom in Las Vegas. And I don't know what to rehearse because he hasn't picked a song. So I guess, well, I guess I'll be- rehearse them both, I guess. And then the phone rang, the backstage phone. Mr. Schaefer called from me with Mr. Davis. He's calling from the plane. And this is before there were phones on the plane. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> He must have had one of those things. <laughs> styrofoam cups. Yeah, and the thing. Yeah. He said, for once in my life, it'll be great. And, you know, and he told me the keys and stuff. And I, now I was fine. And I rehearsed. And I, I decided to tape the arrangement in case he made it in time to at least hear it so he would know what was going on. Tape the arrangement. He comes walking in. Some, by some miracle, his plane lands on time. And he's there in time for one run through of the song. I said, here, listen to the arrangement. I taped it. He said, I don't want to hear it, man. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't want to hear the I said, just listen to it. I said, you may not like it. He said, I like it. I like it. I said, it might not be in the right key. All right, play it for me. So I, I start, I press play, and I, and I start to play the pipe. And he's hearing it on a little cassette. Bum, da-dum, 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 da-dum. His, his head starts to go. He's starting to enjoy it. And he's grooving on it. And he looks at me, and he says, do you know how much fun this would have been if I hadn't have heard this tape? And he was serious. He wanted to go. He's done so many shows, you know. He wanted to just wanted do spontaneous, spontaneous yeah. first time hearing it. Let wow. me just go and see what happens. And I wrecked it because I. Wow. Yeah, I wrecked it anyway. And there's this other. You, you can see this on YouTube now, too, because uh, he comes over on the show and he says, Paul, I was hoping I might do a thing with you and, and the cats. <laughs> and I looked down and I said, it would be my honor, man. I said that. He says, oh, you're doing that Billy Crystal stuff on me. <laughs> so, you know, no good deed. Anyway, thrill, though. It was a thrill. The next time he came on, he knew better. He said, I'm just going to, I know you, you're going to need me to rehearse, so, but I'm going to save some of my best lines for the air. So you, the first time you hear him is on the air. And he was saying, I've been around the world. In a plan. And he changed and Billy Crystal has asked me to star. <laughs> but he, he saved that for air. He had me figure it out. Any more questions? I always thought Sammy and Jerry Lewis were very similar. Same person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How so? How are they similar? They're influenced by each other, for sure. <laughs> yes. But uh, what, what, they, Their singing styles, yeah. the way they talk, the way they get serious... <laughs> I'd like to hear a little bit about that when they get serious. What's yeah. it like when Jerry Lewis gets serious? Well, um, as a filmmaker, <laughs> I think I speak the international language, <laughs> which is mine. And I was always, I think the secret to my comedy is I was nine. I was always nine. I you, never grew up. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm nine. I'm nine. <laughs> I'm nine. Jerry. I'm nine. I mean, and I oh he used to refer to Jerry in third uh, person. Yeah, when Jerry yeah he goes well, I I don't think I'd allow Jerry to go yeah. up and do that. Jerry would never do it, yeah. And what about now, what about Sammy Davis? What does it sound like when he when, when <laughs> he gets a, serious? I shall film <laughs> I love when Marty Short does the serious Jerry with the lozenge. Oh, the lozenge. Really yeah, just, well, Gilbert's got and, the lozenge, too. Got it, and, and I remember Jerry also, when he talks about Dean, he was the handsome guy, and I was the monk. The monkey. Yeah, yeah. monkey. <laughs> right. And he says, you know, well, we had the kind of a, a, a arrangement whereby we both shared the work. I wrote the act, and Dean drank. But that was the... <laughs> Kind of, you know, the, the way we had... My, one of my favorite things, when Jerry acts like he's giving credit to someone else, but likes to put it on himself, he was saying, it was so unfair, the pain that Dean was going through. Yeah, he went through pain. And, I mean, look, here's the reviews. They would only talk about me and not Dean. Jerry is a brilliant performer, and great legendary comedian. And not a word about Dean. <laughs> and it was he the pain would, that he... Yeah. And he went review after review yeah. saying how great he was. Not a word about yeah. Dean. Yeah. Well, 
That's the, you know, that, that's the, the, what, what a person goes through. That's all I can say. But, you know, we mean this, of course, with, with, a, with all the love. We mean it with yes. the love. Yeah. Well, okay. I think, see, this is something like a lot of people don't understand, but I know you understand it. And like in sh- I think we both have that fascination of show business that uh, it's a love-hate relationship. You can only, first of all, you can only parody somebody that you really love. That's the only way you can really get to the higher levels of what they're doing and really do a one-for-one parody when you really appreciate and love the person's talent. How can you argue with Sammy Davis's talent? You can't. He was the most greatest entertainer that ever lived, maybe ever will live. Or some, some say Louis Prima. But I say it's got to be Sammy Davis. So you got that for openers. You're not going to ca- criticize the guy's talent. You can't argue with it because it's there. But that doesn't mean you can't kid him good-naturedly <laughs> and like to talk about when he says, you know, man, if I may say, you, Gilbert, in all seriousness, or as, as Bobby Bittman would say, in all seriousness <laughs> as a comic, the way you, what you do, man, for the kids, and you don't hear enough about the good things you do, you got to have that ability to kid a guy and appreciate him at the same time. And people just say to me, oh, you hate Sammy Davis. Well, no, I love Sammy. I love Sammy Davis. That's the thing. Love him, kid him. It's all part of the same thing. Well, right? Yeah, just like when Well, you- maybe not you. You hate, <laughs> just, you hate it's him. a little different there. Yeah, you like, hate him. When I watch Jerry Lewis, mm. there's like when he gets really egotistical, sometimes really phony and everything, but I love every second of it. Well, there's that too, and we love every second. But you also think you, you can't deny he's the funniest. Oh, yes, right? yes. The bellhop, funny, yeah. oh, right? Oh, nutty professor. The errand boy, right? Yeah, funny. I, I grew right. up on Ola Jerry Lewis movies. So there you She's go. great. There you go. Now, here's a segue. Yeah. Uh, they once asked Sammy, they once said to Sammy Davis Jr. that he's the greatest performer in the world. Yeah. And Sammy said that he didn't agree with that. He thinks Mickey Rooney oh. was the greatest performer in the world. Sammy Davis feels Mickey Rooney was the greatest performer. That's interesting. Mickey well, Rooney, who you also worked with. Worked with him, yes. And he, um, do you, what do you think? Do you think that uh, Mickey Rooney, greatest performer in the world? Uh, I don't know. Certainly was, a brilliant movie actor. Yes, yes, great. Had a lot of wives. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> wives. Yeah. Really hot. Ava Gardner, married yeah. Ava Gardner twice. Yes. Isn't that true? Yes, she did. Yes. yes. I mean, some guys couldn't even marry her once. Sinatra couldn't get her. Couldn't get her once. That's right. Mickey Rooney twice. Tell us about working with Mickey on... uh... Well, George Fenneman. (laughs) Uh, uh... (laughs) I aspire to be George Fenneman. In the 70s, I I did a a sitcom uh, for CBS called A Year at the Top, where I and a kid named Greg Evigan uh, had sold our souls to the devil in return for rock stardom. And Mickey Rooney was on the first episode, the first hour-long debut episode. I was telling Gilbert about it before you got here. Really, he was supposed to be on the series, but we made four episodes with him. And it wasn't his fault, but the episodes were so bad that they had to shelve all four and start all over again. By this time, he, he had to move on. He was bored. He said, I'll do the first one. Uh, when I first started working with him, I was thrilled to be working for him, and he was so funny, I was writing down the jokes that he would tell during the read-through on the back of my script. Like he would say, well, a guy says, when I get older, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be buried in a copper coffin. He said, why? And he pointed to his wrist, says, to help my arthritis. As if like a you know, the <laughs> copper thing. And then the next day, he would say, the guy says, copper coffin, and, it was, and the day after that, copper coffin helped my arthritis. So, same jokes coming back time after time after time. Uh, not his fault. He thought he didn't know anybody was listening to, let alone writing it down like I was. Uh, funny guy, though. Funny guy. And he has that type of thing that so many stars have where they have to be the center of attention. That's what makes them great. And even if somebody else is performing... Well, they have to be enjoying it more than anybody else in the room. That's what makes them great. That's why he's great. One of the reasons why he's great. And you did, you did that show for Norman Lear and Don Kirshner. Yeah, it was and Norman Lear's uh, first flop, uh-huh. I think, as a matter of now, fact. Now, and your, yeah. your co-star, Greg, Greg Evigan, Evigan yeah. who would later be in My Two Dads with Paul Reiser. How about that? Yeah. yeah. And, and that, BJ uh, and the Bear. First, yes. they replaced, he replaced me with a monkey and did a BJ <laughs> and the Bear. <laughs> 
That's and right. then he was in, yeah, my two dads with Paul Reiser, yeah. Yeah. yeah is, so. is that where your relationship with Don Kirshner began and the impression of Don Kirshner started? Um, when Speak- I was doing this show, and, and Kirshner was the co-producer with, with Norman Lear, and I got on with Kirshner right away because I knew everything about him. Mm-hmm. I had read about him in Time magazine. I knew about how he was the man with the golden ear. I knew about he was the music supervisor for the monkeys. And so he got a kick out of me because I got a kick out of him. And one day he called me and he said, I've decided to go on camera doing on my own show. You know, he had Don Kirshner's rock concert where a voiceover sure, announcer would say, and now Edgar Winter is white trash. Well, he said, I'm going to go on TV, on camera, and do the intros myself. And he would say, you know, they used to say Sullivan was stiff, but he had the gig, you know? Right, and they would say, right. I'm stiff, Sullivan was stiff, but he had the gig. So he was going to, as stiff as he was, he was going to go on TV. He wasn't anything but stiff in regular life. He would be a fast-talking New York publisher who would say, forget about it with the Carol Kings and the Sadakas, and we never looked at a contract. Herbie made him out. He didn't look at him, but, for, you know, it was over with the Connie Francis and the things with the monkeys and the Mickey Dolans and the stummies that we gave him. And a mile a minute talking, and then when he went on camera, he slowed right down and his eyes glazed over, and he said, I'm Don Kushner, <laughs> and welcome to Rock Concert. And I never, I mean, the, the impression that it left with me was so strong. <laughs> That when the show flopped and I got my old job on Saturday Night Live back, I started doing the impression of Kirshner on, on the air, and uh, the rest is... I think uh, it's the first time I remember being aware of you, I mean, watching SNL, but seeing that Don Kirshner impression and it Well, just thank you, so I was really, you know, I channeled him, uh, <laughs> because I really felt, you know, well, I, I had you, a simpatico with you him. You say, you parody what you love. You parody what you love. That is the point, I think, that what I'm trying to make. I love how... Gilbert you- hates the people that he... Yeah. <laughs> I love them. I love them. That's where he and I differ. Here's a name out of nowhere. Okay. But I don't know. I just thought, because she's really of, like, more modern but still old Hollywood. Raquel Welch. Yeah. uh, Had a little experience with her. Uh, She hosted uh, one of the uh, Saturday Night Live shows, I think, in the first season. And... um, Sometimes um, when Lorne Michaels, the famous producer of the show, would uh, have a host that he wouldn't exactly know what to do with, yet he would say, get a rehearsal room and go in there with Paul and figure out what you're going to sing. So here I was, fresh out of Canada, 25 years old. I'm in a little rehearsal room with Raquel Welsh, and she's doing her act for me, including what she called the hot tamale numbers. <laughs> And I would say, well, I don't know if that hot tamale number is better than that hot tamale number. (laughs) One of the greatest days. Greatest days. And, of course, Chevy Chase wrote the sketch for her. I don't know whether it actually played. The sketch was called Take Off Your Shirt. Hi, I'm Chevy Chase, and welcome to Take Off Your Shirt. Today's guest, Raquel Welsh. And you can guess where the thing goes from that. (laughs) You know, see, now, Chevy Chase is one of those people. Yeah. And he's in that category, I guess I could say with both, with, with Jerry Lewis, where you could say the same thing. And that's like, he was always nice to me. He was always nice to yeah, me. Yeah, Chevy Chase was always nice to me the few times I've met Jerry Lewis. Always, always nice, nice to you. But, but it's like, you, you hear stuff. Some of the guys who did the roast of Chevy, I suppose, may have heard a few things. Uh, I don't think any of them knew him. Uh, But they had heard a few things, and I think it's just Chevy, you know. We in comedy, Gilbert, if I may say. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we're trying to be edgy. Yeah. I don't know if this is, you know, goes with Chevy or not, but we're always trying to get close to the edge, and sometimes we fall over the edge. But you can't be edgy unless you're willing to get as close to the edge as you can. Chevy may have fallen over a little bit with with the insult humor. Perhaps. I'm just saying perhaps. He was always nice to me. Yeah, he and was you. always and nice to me. Yeah. I He's always worked been with nice him. to me the few always times nice that I've you. met him, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So they were both always nice to always both nice of us. Always nice to both of us. So there Chevy you go. Chase and Jerry Lewis <laughs> I think we've got were that. nice yeah. to both. Yes, we've got now, that. Now, we thing. both, we both uh, have a great admiration and respect for Cindy Crawford's uh, infomercial. Well, now you're really getting into my wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Cindy Crawford's infomercial. Now, this this has to do with uh, the product uh, Meaningful Beauty. Yeah, by Dr. Chavard, the French the, doctor. You're talking about uh, Dr. Jean-Louis Savard. Yes. Yeah, Jean- yeah Savard. S E B A. U-G-H, I believe. <laughs> He's known as the youth guru. Yes. He's known as, uh, I don't know what else. And I, I remember he tells the story <laughs> with, with Cindy listening yeah. and uh, being very touched by it. He goes, well, uh, she, she walks into my office and she's the most beautiful girl in the world. Yes. And what does Cindy do? Just a very modest, doesn't say anything. Hands together in prayer. Yes, bent yes. over, like sort of like a Buddhist <laughs> salutation. Yes. Yes. Oh, doctor. Yes. Oh, you shouldn't have. Well, and, and Valerie uh, Valerie Bertinelli is well, the interviewer. She was the interviewer on the classic, the first episode of this. They, yes. I think they've got a couple of them going now. Yeah, but I don't like the second. No. Well, there's no Valerie Bertinelli. No. I mean, <laughs> without her, what do you have? You know, you got a chick with a mole, you know. You need really the full, the full, uh, uh, the Luberon, though. You really should visit it sometime, Gilbert. Uh, that's where the melon. <laughs> Dr. Savag has found a new melon, a miracle melon, <laughs> that grows in a secluded area of France called the Luberon. You should visit it sometime. And they have a great scene where he's actually out in the field with a tiny little vial that's like half an inch big, yeah. and he holds it into the sunlight. He's holding it up to the yeah. sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you know, he... <laughs> Let's talk to the doctor. Well, he didn't have time to come in for, for and the they, taping. Yeah, and it He's looks by like... a satellite, yeah. <laughs> Really is in the next room, of course. Yeah. So obvious. It's like they painted the Eiffel Tower <laughs> behind him, yeah. <laughs> He's in the next room. Well, I'm glad that somebody else is as and weird and perverted as I have. has watched it as many times as I and has memorized it as I have. And and Valerie Perrine is very good. Valerie with Bertinelli. The, Valerie <laughs> Perrine. Oh, have... Valerie Perrine will be on next t- Love Sunday. Valerie great. Perrine, yeah. Valerie Bertinelli has a great self-effacing. Yeah, how does that go again? Oh, uh... Sh- well, when she says, I use it morning and night, I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you meant? Well, I love when she looks at the two pictures of Cindy Crawford oh, side yeah. by side and goes, this was 20 years later. Cindy? Cindy? <laughs> She's Louise or something like that, right? Cindy? And we wanted to make new pictures. You know, these are a few, three years old. We wanted to do new yes. pictures, so we did these new pictures. Cindy. Uh, now. Oh, God. Yes, yeah, no, go ahead. No, Valerie Perrine. <laughs> Valerie Perrine, great. Um, only met her once. Uh, she didn't really know who I was. Uh, but um, one of my favorite actresses. Any, any personal experience with her? I never met her, but what I loved about Valerie Perrine is she had no qualms about getting naked in every movie she was in. Well, an actress has to. (laughs) Except for Superman. (laughs) Yeah. You got, I I would have no qualms with that that either. You know? Better, I'm only here because I said you do it naked. She She was one of the few who was naked on TV. What was she naked in on TV? Steam bath oh. with Bill Bixby. That's right. I don't know how I miss Steam bath. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it was a play written by Drew's father. You're sort of like the guy, uh, Mr. Skin. <laughs> yeah. You could say that. Yeah, who fast forwards to the good parts. <laughs> Isn't that what you're like? <laughs> And they always do those bad puns in the Mr. Skin one. Yeah. Like, uh, they had one, they said, you know, you'll be mad about Helen Hunt's nude nude scene. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And when you see Helen Hunt's naked body, it will definitely give you a riser. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Like Paul Riser. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know that. <laughs> now, Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Ever had dealings with Frank? No, I never got to meet Frank. Um, but I understand that in the uh, in his compound, Palm Springs, he named each one of the different cabins after one of his hit records. 
Wow. Tom Dreesen, he, <laughs> wow. he usually stays in the tender trap. <laughs> so that's all I know about. And you know that Sinatra, Frank Sinatra Jr., you remember when he was kidnapped? Sure. Yes. Yeah, wasn't that Fascinating. terrible? Fascinating. Yeah. And he, the kidnappers uh, eventually had to let him go. You know why? Why? They heard him humming in the trunk. <laughs> Seriously. Now, here's what I don't understand. <laughs> here's what I don't understand. Yeah. If you're Frank Sinatra and you know every gangster in the world. Well, you're alleged, with, allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. Now, if your son's kidnapped, wouldn't you just make one call and have them both killed? You, you should be able to. I don't know. I can't, I can't explain it. What do you think happened there? I have no idea. Now, obviously, they heard him humming. In the- <laughs> obviously, yeah. And, and you worked with Frank Jr. Um, yes, definitely. Worked with Frank Jr. Uh, because um, in the 80s, there was a band called Was Not Was. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, Don, Don Was. Yes, yeah. Don Was. Yeah. And now the, uh, uh, head e- of- Everybody Walks the Dinosaur. Walk the That's Dinosaur right. was their thing. And Don Was gone on to a great, do great things as a record exec and producer and everything. Um, but he had a band, Was Not Was, uh, with a guy who, they pretended to be brothers, but they really weren't, but maybe they were. And their <laughs> tradition was they would do one Vegasy loungy kind of cut per, uh, per album. One album, they used Mel Torme to sing a song about a kid who, uh, you know, like a suicide, you know, teenage suicide, and the record was called Zaz Turned Blue. Zaz being the name of the guy. Zaz Turned Blue. <laughs> He didn't know what to do. And, and then the following uh, album, Frank Jr. singing one called Wedding Vows in Vegas, and it was brilliant. And we had them on, Was Not Was, with Frank Jr., special guest Frank Jr. singing uh, the, uh, Vegas, uh, Wedding Vows in Vegas. So um, Morty, who we all remember uh, so well as being the producer of Letterman back in those days, sure said, let me take you in and introduce you to Frank Jr. And he did. Took me to his, his uh, dressing room. Frank opened the door. Morty says, uh, Frank, this is a Paul Schaefer big... What I do not, I do not understand who that is. Because he spoke... <laughs> like his dad, he spoke like a character in Guys and Dolls. I do not know who... You know. I said, Mr. Sinatra, I absolutely love the record. He said, what record? I do not understand what... Oh, Don Was's record. Oh, that's another story. You know, he had to make sure that I understood. wasn't his record. It's a record that he did for Don Was. Uh, and I said, uh, I loved your record, which I remembered from the 60s. He had a record out in the rock and roll era, his attempt to get a rock and roll hit. And it was called Shadows on a Foggy Day. I said, Frank, I love... Shadows on a Foggy Day. She says that. He says that record got me dropped from Mercury Records. I said, What? How? How did that? He said it was about LSD. And I, they wanted me to do a follow up the same. And I said, I will not sing another pro drug song. And they dropped me from the label. So there you go. You know, who would have thought Shadows on a Foggy Day was a pro drug song? Shadows on a foggy day. <laughs> That's his idea of a rock and roll single. Not too hard to find. <laughs> okay. Now, we're also big fans of the same film starring or co starring Sammy Jr. and now Frank Sinatra Jr. Yeah. with Sid Melton. Well, this is something that uh, <laughs> yes. I believe you turned me on to. I don't yes, know yes. how a thing like this gets made. But to <laughs> talk, talk to me a little bit about it. Tell the people, uh, the fine folks at home, what, they, they what you're talking about. They're Sid Melton, yeah. one of these like character uh, comic actors. Yeah, from the 50s, 40s, he, 50s. He, yeah. he was in uh, Make Room yeah. for Daddy. And that's how we yeah. know him. He was, and, yeah. uh, but he'd pop up in like, uh, you know, old movies. Yeah. like Humph- Oh, he was in Lady Sings the Blues. That's right, he was and the lady sings the blues. And real funny looking uh, guy. Yeah. And when he was really old, he made this movie uh, and called me in the morning where Frank Sinatra Jr. is his agent. Plays his agent, yeah. 
and it is just, it never was released, amazingly. First of all, how old was, was Sid Melton at this point? Oh, my God. He was like a day away from death. Like in the 90s. Yeah, right? yeah. And then the movie was about how he was having an affair or something. Isn't yes, something? with some hot young girl. Hot young chick, and he's 90. <laughs> Hot young thirty year old girl, <laughs> and it's the whole thing comes across as very dreamlike because it makes no there's no rhyme or reason. I thought to I it. dreamed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it was true. But we b- both became hypnotized. Well, if you see it, you know you can't help but be hypnotized. By yeah. it. <laughs> but it's because we love. Sid Melton and, and Frank Jr. Well, I think remember, that's remember what? Not you. You hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I, I once visited Sid Melton's apartment. You with did Gino. really with Gino, with Gino Salomon. Yeah. Gino Salomon. Gino and, yeah, and, it's a callback. And it was like some little ratty apartment by the airport. Yeah, it was. It was quite sad. You once told me that it was. He was like six inches from the road. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no front lawn area at all. Oh, God. Just front door, and when highway. You, yeah, when you open the door from the street, <laughs> yeah. there's no, like, uh, <laughs> there was no stoop. No foyer or anything. No stoop. No stoop. <laughs> there was, it was, like, flat on the ground. If it rained, yeah. it would rain in the apartment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Now, you but, were there, eh? You were at Sid Melton's. Do you remember what Dean Martin said when Jerry Lewis toward the uh, the end of their team? Uh, when Jerry Lewis said it was about the love we have. No, are you talking about when the, the the reunion on the telethon? No, no, no. This is this is a story that when Martin and Lewis were really arguing and they hated each other. Yeah. Jerry wanted to reach out to Dean. He said, you know, I think what people really loved, uh, our success was our love. Mm -hmm. And Dean Martin said to Jerry Lewis, well, you talk love all you want, Pally. When I look at you, all I see is a fucking dollar sign. Ooh, boy. Yeah. Well, first of all, you do a great Dean. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) you Wow, see. Like John Biner doing that. You can see where that might have caused a riff. Oh, yeah. Perhaps, you know. Anyway, it was a love story, though. You oh, know, yes, yeah. yes, the book, The yeah. Love Story. Yeah, it was a love, love story. George Fenneman, what were you going to say? I was just, <laughs> just going to talk about how much I loved reading your book. Well, that's very sweet of you. Which uh, is called We'll Be Here for the Rest of Our Lives, yes, a it's swinging showbiz saga. Still downloadable, I think. I, listen, I got the yeah. audio version, too. Before we let you go, Paul, uh, we have to ask you about the significance of James Brown's cape in your life. <laughs> well, of course, um, it has a, a number of, uh, of significant uh, features. Uh, first time I saw it uh, and the cape act was on the Tammy show in the 60s. I had to get up uh, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. That's the only time they played this thing. It was in kin- a kinescope that they played in theaters. I saw him do that cape. It was the first time that the white audience ever saw James Brown. I never got over it. Um, and then uh, somehow I ended up in a position where I got to do the Cape Act every Friday night on Letterman. Explain to the, the for two years what, what the Cape Act uh, well, was in James Brown. Well, it, it was a thing. Uh, he said in, in his book that he got the idea from Gorgeous George, the wrestler, mm-hmm. who wore a bunch of capes uh, when he would walk into the wrestling ring. Uh so James would wear the cape, and uh, uh, as he was getting ready to go off stage, uh, one of his henchmen would come on with the cape, put it over his shoulders. He would walk off stage like a broken man. He would then get re enervated and uh, throw the cape off and come back on for one more curtain call. And now the henchman would come on with a different color cape, put that on him. He would do the same thing, broken man walking off. He didn't want to, uh, uh, the audience to see the pride of a man Broken from a, from a woman, you know, and, and the henchman was even embarrassed for him. But he would throw that cape off. And that was the act that I would do uh, on Letterman each Friday night. It like in, in the middle of two commercials, there would be like a, about 30 seconds there, I'd be doing the cape. Right. Throwing it off, falling down on my knees. More recently, I went to an auction, the James Brown Estate Auction at Christie's, and bought one of the actual capes where I have it now on display in my house. 
uh, behind glass, uh, and right next to it, Murray the K's hat. So wow. this is good. that's the kind of the, the you know the. I remember seeing you do the bit on Letterman, and guest stars would come out and wrap the cape. Yes, you, different, Tina Fey and Whoopi and, and Jack Black. Fantastic. Different, different guest yeah, stars just, coming out and putting the cape on me, including James Brown, the godfather himself, came out and put the cape on me. So, you know, I want to talk about a guy who's had his share of thrills in show business. That's it. I definitely have. Now, here's Thanks a, for bringing it up. Here's a very quick yes. question okay. that I'm sure you'll have a quick answer All right. to. Now, what are your plans now that Letterman? Oh, you and everybody yes. else yes. in the whole <laughs> world have been asking me, yes. what are you going to do now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not retiring. You know, my boss is retiring. I don't plan yes. to retire. <laughs> I'm going to keep playing the piano. That's all I know. I'm going to lie down initially, and when I get up, I'll see what happens. Try to, <laughs> try to keep playing the piano. That's, all, that's what I'm going to do. Thanks for asking. And what Sly Stallone do? And not Sly Stallone, Sly Stone. Yeah, I don't What's know. What's he doing? Well, I don't know what he's doing. I actually. heard he was homeless and living in his oh, car. Oh, I read that too. He was in a, living in a trailer. You never know what that. Living yeah. in his car, living in a trailer. Yes. Living in a studio, living in the Plaza Hotel. You never, <laughs> you never know with that guy. Well, <laughs> this has been... <laughs> this has been Gilbert Gottfried. You know how uh, John... Don, <laughs> How uh, Don Kirshner would uh, answer that, though. He had a way, Don Kirshner had a way of refuting a thing like that. You say to me, he, he's, uh, Sly's living in his car. Yeah, uh, Sly's living in his car. He's living in his car, he's not living in his car. That's how he would. <laughs> living in his car, he's not living in his car. That's how he would do it. Is that what you're going to sign off? Pete, Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, salt and Pepper. Oh, oh yes. Sure, with Sammy. With yes, Sammy. Yes, that Jerry only directed. Yeah, and then there was a follow up to it. Oh, Sequel. one more time. Salt and Pepper, one more time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is how the theme, theme went like that Salt and Pepper, one more time. No. Salt and Pepper, one more time. <laughs> now. Didn't Sammy also sing the theme song of The Errand Boy? How did that starring go? Starring Jerry Lewis. How did that go? Oh, I forget. God, yeah. this is going to kill me. This will come back to me All right, we gotta in the get middle that. of we a gotta night. Get a hold that's of a, that. that's a Drew Friedman question. Yeah, we yeah. Get a hold oh, of that. God. He'll know. What did you say about Drew Friedman? His dad wrote his dad Oh, wrote no, 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 no. It was the disorderly order. Oh, he sang... Yeah. How would that have gone? It was something <laughs> like, and all I remember is the name, Disorderly Orderly. Yeah. But, and I think it was Sammy, and I think he was going, <laughs> then disorderly, orderly. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I got to hear. We wow. got to get a hold of that. <laughs> Can we find that? Can we get a Will hold of Will make it my business. Yeah. And <laughs> edit, it, edit it into the podcast. I will find yeah. it. <laughs> Have it playing throughout yeah. the entire... Right. I, I remember Sammy on I Dream of Jeannie. That was, a, that was also a great, uh, wow. a great episode. Phil Spector, too. I was That's on right. I, I Dream That's of right. Jeannie. Yeah. <laughs> well, are, were you going to sign on? Oh, I guess yeah. so. <laughs> okay. Could you, could you take us out as Don Kirshner, Paul? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... Uh, uh, dear Anthony, <laughs> who's a gentleman, called me on a kid named Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> He's one of the funniest gentlemen ever. <laughs> Something like that. Are you going to sign on? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I, I can't top that. Okay. So, uh, Gilbert Coffrey's amazing colossal podcast, and I'm and I'm here with my co-host Frank Santo Padre, yeah. and we've been interviewing uh, the legendary. Oh, you should. Yes, <laughs> yes. You don't have. It's true. As as a performer, he's one of a kind, and as a human being, he's one of the kindest. Oh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to say that. Eugene Levy once said, as Bobby Bittman, uh, as a performer, he's marvelous. As a human being, he's absolutely marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's someone who taught me. <laughs> 
it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good Go. night, everyone. It's been a pleasure being on your podcast, both of you guys. Thanks, Thank Paul. you, Thanks. Paul. Thanks, Thanks for doing it, buddy. 